This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. We'll, uh, we'll continue our discussion of least norm solution now. No, there, come on, there's, there's no way anybody can read that. Can you actually read that? No, okay. So you could, there's a couple things you could do. Um, you could move close, every, if, if you can't read, you could move closer to a monitor. Or you could extract just enough information out of it, out of this little TV, to get a rough idea of where I am actually in the notes. That's, that's your other method, and, and do a sort of a correspondence. But anyway, your choice, but you're free also to just move somewhere where you can read it. So. Yeah, you can either crowd up here or in back of one of those. I guess, uh, I guess they're working on trying to get the big screen routed. Okay. So least norm solution. As I said last time, this is something like the dual of least squares approximate solution. So in least norm solution, we're studying the equation ax equals y. But in this case, a is fat. And we're assuming it's full rank. So that means you have m equations that constrain a variable x. Uh, but you have fewer equations than unknown. So it means you have extra degrees of freedom. What that means is that ax equals y actually has lots of solutions. There are lots of solutions. It means the null space of A um, is more than just the zero vector. In fact, it's, uh, it's exactly n minus m dimensional, the null space. So there's a lot of freedom in choosing x. So one particular x that satisfies ax equals y is the vector of least norm. So that's the least norm solution. And that's xln. And it has the f it's, the it's just given by the following formula, a transpose a a transpose inverse y. So that's the least norm solution. It's easy to see it's a solution, because if you multiply this by a, you get a a transpose times a a transpose inverse times y. And the transpose and the other one, they annihilate each other. And you get y. So you get a solution that's clear. Uh, this relies on the fact that if a is fat and full rank, a a transpose is invertible. That's a basic, uh, basic fact. Um, and actually, what you could show now easily using QR factorization. And in fact, for all practical purposes, we're going we're gonna to do that ourselves in a few minutes. OK. So this is the least norm solution. It's a, it's a solution. Now, watch out, because the least squares, I mean, the main thing you want to do with this material is make sure that although it looks very similar to the least squares approximate solution, all, the formulas look the same. A lot, everything looks similar. Um, you have to be very careful to sort out in your mind which is which, just because they look so dangerously close. So this x least norm is actually a solution of ax equals y. Whereas in general, xls, which is a transpose a, 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 tran a transpose a quantity a in inverse times a transpose y, and that formula is only for a skinny full rank matrix a. In that case, that's generally not a solution of ax equals y. It is, it is the x that minimizes, essentially, the hit distance, or the error, or the residual, so it's, and is generally not a solution of ax equals y, whereas here, this one certainly is. OK. Um, so this, this point, x least norm, essentially solves this optimization problem. It says, among the, among the vectors that satisfy ax equals b, I don't know where the b came in, but ax equals y, you should minim among those, you should min take the one of minimum norm. And that's this optimization problem. The solution is unique, and it is given by x least norm. Now, we can show this directly uh, by direct argument, and that's easy. Let's let x be any other solution of ax equals y. Well, then ax minus x least norm is 0, because ax is y, and so is ax ln. They're both y. So you subtract and get 0. And now let's calculate the inner product of x minus x least norm and x least norm. Well, you just simply just plug this in and do some uh, matrix uh, manipulations here. Here you have this thing transpose times a transpose. 
But the product of two transpose is the same of the, of, of the product in reverse order quantity transpose. So I write it this way. Um, now, this uh, is actually, this is going to be uh, 0. Because ax minus axln is 0. And so actually, the right, hand, the right hand side doesn't even matter. This vector is 0, so that's 0. That says that the x minus x least norm and x least norm are perpendicular. Now, when two vectors are perpendicular, it means that you, if you want to calculate the norm squared of the sum, it's very simple. It's the sum of the norm squareds of the individual components. So some people call that uh, Pythag the generalized Pythagoras theorem or something. Anyway, it's nothing. You write out the formula for the norm squared of a sum, and the cross term goes away. So it says that if we write out x as, in a strange way, x least norm plus x minus x least norm, no one could argue with that. But this thing and this are orthogonal. And therefore, the norm squared of the sum is the sum of the squares of their norm squared separately. So you get this thing plus that. Well, that says this thing, of course, is going to be non-negative. And you can see immediately that the norm squared of x is bigger than the norm squared of x least norm. And that tells you this. Since x was any solution of y, that tells you that any solution of y is going to have a norm at least as big as s least norm. And this is the proof now that x least norm, in fact, minimizes the, the norm uh, among all solutions of ax equals y. So that's just sort of a direct argument. And the geometry is pretty easy to, to see. The set, you consider a set of vectors that satisfy ax equals y. Now, I mean, this is silly because it's an R2. And here, here this is a one-dimensional set. It's an affine set. In general, it's just an affine set here. In fact, with a dimension, which is n minus m. In, gen in, in, in the general case here. And so you can imagine that as a plane or something if this is an R3 uh, with, um, with uh, a, actually just one equation. It's a plane. And then you're asked to find the, the one of least norm. That's the point on that plane or hyperplane or affine set which is closest to the origin. It's the one of least norm. And that's this one here. And you can see if you shift this, you get the null space of A. That's that, that actually gives you the part that sort of, the, it's the parallel part of AX equals Y. It's shifted to the origin. And you can see, in fact, just visually here, that X minus, um, that X least norm is, is actually going to be orthogonal to the null space of A. And that's this orthogonality condition. And of course, you get up a projection interpretation. X least norm is the projection of the point zero on the solution set of AX equals Y. So that's it. Okay. Now, this is, uh, this formula, A transpose A, A transpose inverse, that's, the, that's also the pseudo inverse. But this is the pseudo inverse of a, of a full rank fat A. So, so far, the symbol, uh, dagger, I guess has uh, two uh, overloadings. Uh, it's overloaded, and it applies in two contexts. A, dagger applies when the matrix A is skinny and full rank, in which case A dagger means A transpose A inverse, A transpose and is associated with least squares uh, approximate solutions. You also have now an interpretation of A dagger, or a definition of A dagger, when A is fat and full rank, in which case it's A transpose times AA transpose inverse. Um, and, it's, and it's actually something that gives you the least norm solution. So that's, that's A dagger. By the way, in about three weeks, we will complete the overloading of, of dagger. I think the machine just turned all the way on. Okay. I'm going to reboot it. Or, some, or, or does that mean you're giving up? Uh, okay. No, no. It sounds like it's, 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 it's yeah, it's re reboot minus H. That's hard. Um, okay. So, okay. Uh, so, we, in a couple of weeks, we're going we're gonna to complete our overloading of A dagger, and we're actually going to assign a meaning to A dagger uh, to any matrix except the zero matrix. So, all non-zero matrices will actually have a pseudo inverse. Only zero will not. Hey, great. So, anyway, okay, great. Thank you. OK, great. All right. OK, so we'll get to that. But for the, for the moment, the only context in which you know about the pseudo inverse are full rank matrices. So all full rank matrices uh, have a pseudo inverse. They have different formulas that apply in different contexts. Like, that's what overloading means. OK, now this matrix, A transpose A, A transpose inverse, that's a right inverse of A. We, we know that. I minus A transpose 
A, A transpose inverse A gives projection onto the null space of A. Um, by the way, this matrix alone gives projection onto the null space of A uh, perp, this thing, the orthogonal complement. Okay? So this is A transpose A, A transpose inverse A. Okay? Now, the same formulas for a full rank skinny matrix, uh, not the same, the analogous formulas are something like this. Um, a dagger or the, uh, or the pseudo inverse, or uh, I guess um, in the UK, the Moore Penrose inverse, is A transpose A inverse uh, A transpose. And that's a left inverse. And interestingly, in this case, it's A times A transpose A inverse A is projection on, on range of A. So the anomaly you see is the I minus here. That's the, that's the anomaly, essentially. That's it. Okay, so uh, do watch out for these. Um, I always check. Uh, my mnemonic is real simple. Uh, if you see this, let me see if I can do it right. I'll try to draw it right. If you see this, everything is cool. You know what I mean by that? So skinny times fat inverse, well, sorry, it's not cool. But it, it's not obviously uncool. Okay, this is always trouble. See that? That is never cool, ever. Okay, so just, oh, and by the way, if I, if, if, of course, if these multiplied out and became non-square, that's super uncool because that's a syntax error. Okay, so my mnemonic is this. And you might ask, really? You mean I actually, when I'm working and doing stuff, I actually, yes, I do. So I, I draw this picture. I don't let anyone see it, you know, because it's embarrassing a little bit, but this is what I do. Okay, that's cool. That is totally uncool. No, not totally. Totally uncool is this. Is, is this times, uh, let's see if I can get it right. There we go. See that? That's, un that's really uncool. Okay. Oh, uh, by the way, I think now you should be able to read uh, the little note on the, web, on the course website that's called Crimes Against Matrices. So you should just read it. Um, should, should, make, should make sense. Okay. Well, Let's see how uh, the least norm solution connects to QR factorization. It does. A is skinny and full rank. Therefore, A transpose is, uh, sorry, A is fat and full rank. Therefore, A transpose is skinny and full rank. And that means that when you write out, when you do the QR factorization of a skinny full rank matrix, here's what it looks like. You're going to have A is, you get Q, and then you get R. But, in, but R now is invertible. R is square, and it's invertible in this case. Okay. So it's, well, it's invertible. OK. Um, so it's, it's non-singular, R. And it turns out you work out the formulas. You just plug in QR for A transpose. So A is R transpose, Q transpose. And you just plug in the formulas and let things, I mean, carefully. So you should do this yourself. I'm not going to do it now. You should just do this carefully. Carefully let things cancel, watching out for the, the usual things, like Q transpose Q. That's I, but Q, Q transpose is not. So just when you do this carefully, you find out, not surprisingly, that, that this A dagger works out to be nothing but Q R minus transpose, or R inverse transpose, like that. So that, that's what it works out to be. And I forget what the formula is for the least squares one, but it's very, it's very similar. And it's just kind of got, maybe it's, I don't know, does anyone remember? It's maybe it's R inverse Q transpose. It's something like this. So this is the, from a, from a few lectures ago, is it this? That this this is in the context of least squares. Is that is that it? You have the notes there. Is that right? Yeah. So that's close. Okay. So, and you know, after a while, you're going to get used to these things where these things look similar, but the order is different, and some things are transposed, and all that sort of stuff. So you're gonna. So it's why you have to be careful. Okay. Oh, and the uh, norm of the least norm solution is, in fact, the, the norm of the inverse. Uh, it's simply the norm of R minus transpose Y. So that gives you, in fact, the norm. OK? So that's the, uh, that's the idea. OK. Now, I want to now uh, talk about, uh, essentially, actually, what we want to do is, is do the parent of all of these, is go up in abstraction to the parent of both least norm and least squares. Because it's actually quite, it's useful to know. Because they're both, they're obviously relate, deeply related. Let's see how they're related. 
Well, the least norm, we'll start by handling the least norm problem and solving it in a more conventional way. If you want to minimize x transpose x, that's of course the norm squared. Subject to x equals y, the standard method, uh, I guess, in, I guess since uh, the early 19th century, actually earlier than that, um, is to do the following. You take the objective, and to that you add um, a Lag Lagrange multipliers times the constraint. So here, there's a vector of constraints, and we take a, a, vector, uh, a vector multiplier lambda. Um, by the way, I don't mean for this to be obvious about how all these Lagrange multipliers work. I tell you the truth, I never understood it myself. Um, in fact, it's generally taught as a, beha a set of behaviors, right, that a monkey can do. Uh, I guess it's generally taught like in high school. No one has a clue what it means, what the pictures are or anything. Is that correct? Does anyone here actually, did anyone like draw pictures of this that anyone understood? Actually, how many people have seen like Lagrange multipliers for constrained optimization? For how many was it taught absolutely as simply a set of behaviors? This is what you do. Wait, does that mean that the rest of you actually understand it? No, it's possible. Maybe things have changed since I was subjected to this. It's, it's, it's possible. Okay, all right. Anyway, I don't mind saying I never understood it until, uh, well, a while ago. Uh, but I, I certainly didn't understand it for a while. So here I'm not going to go into it. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into it. I'm just, we're just going to say here's how, here's how Lagrange multiplies. Here's what you do. So here's what you do. You form this Lagrangian like this. And then the optimality conditions are that the gradient of this with respect to both x and also with respect to lambda should vanish. If I take the gradient of this with respect to lambda, I get ax minus y, and I find that should vanish. Well, that was really super duper useful because it tells me that the optimal solution must satisfy ax equals y. Well, I knew that because that was a constraint. Okay, so this was not exactly informative. Over here, though, it's actually very interesting. If I take the gradient with respect to x, I find out that it's 2x. That's the gradient of this. And that's why, by the way, a lot of people will just put in a one-half here just to clear the twos out of formulas and things. That's so you'll see that. Uh, you get the gradient of that. And the gradient of this thing with respect to x is actually a transpose lambda. So we get 2x plus a transpose lambda is 0. Okay. Well, that's interesting. So you solve that. Uh, and it says that x is minus one-half a transpose lambda. Let's take this and plug it into this, which was hardly a revelation, ax equals y. And you get a formula for lambda. So lambda is minus 2 a a transpose inverse y. Now I take this lambda and I plug it right in there, and I have my final solution, which is this. So we've re-derived by a mysterious method the same thing we derived by a direct al algebra uh, three pages ago. OK, so this is just to do this because we're going to use Lagrange multipliers to look at the general case. So let's do some examples of, of least norm. This is a stupid and silly one, but it's, you know, you, that's, the, that's a good way to start. So we go back to our mass. And we're going to apply forces on it for 10 one-second periods consecutively. And we're interested in the position at the end of 10 seconds and the velocity. So you have y equals ax, where a is 2 by 10, and a is fat. And I think you even should remember some of the, uh, some of the entries in a. I think the top row of a, the, the entries are shrinking as you go along it. And the bottom one, they're all ones or something like that. OK. And we're going to find the least norm force that transfers the mass unit distance with zero final velocity. So it's got to take the mass, it's got to uh, accelerate it, and then it's got to decelerate it over here. Although we leave open the possibility that the right thing to do would be to take the mass and move in the other direction. Uh, and then, I mean, that doesn't sound too plausible. It's actually not the case. But anyway, we're, we're leaving that open. We don't require it to simply move this, although it does. OK. Now, when you work out the solution, in fact, this one has an analytic solution, and it's really, uh, it, it's, um, when you work it out, it, it turns out you should apply a force that is aff uh, that's an affine function of the time, or uh, of, of the discrete time. So basically, you should push it on the first instance, and the first second you push it hard, less hard, less hard, right at t equals, right around t equals 5, you switch, uh, sorry, right around t equals 5, you switch from pushing it very meekly so this is basically up to, for five seconds, you accelerate the mass, although you push, you, you push less hard later. Um, and we can make, I mean, we can anthropomorphize this easily. Um, why is the least norm solution doing this? Why would you push harder at first than later? What's that? Uh, just a vague, this is going to be a hand-waving answer, but you just need a vague one. 
Why would you push harder at first? Why shouldn't it just be like this? Why shouldn't you just push hard and then ex and then and then pull? Yeah, if you push, how much you push at the end? That's it. That's it exactly. Okay, so it is more efficient in terms of meters per newton to push early on. That's what it is. So this weights this weights the force with the efficiency. So you're pushing harder first because you get more meters per newton of push at the beginning. Okay, and then it's symmetrical, so you, the, the, you accelerate and you decelerate like that, and that's the picture. Okay, let me ask you a couple, as long as we're on this one topic, I'm gonna ask you a couple of other questions just for fun. I think once before I admitted uh, publicly that uh, least squares type objectives, and in particular the sum of the uh, xi squared here, the sum of the forces squared here, generally speaking, actually, are of no particular practical relevance. It's generally not what you want to do, right? So uh, thrusters don't come with a box on the label or a tag hanging off the side that says, no matter what you do, do not apply uh, a signal whose sum of squares is more than this. They don't come that way, okay? So what they, the way they really come is they have things like this. There's a maximum force you can apply, or there's an amount of fuel you use. Now, by the way, these have names. The, this is just for fun, right? But just to give, just to let you know a little bit about this. Um, the infinity norm, I think we encountered this once. This is, it's the maximum of the absolute value. So in fact, the way you would say this, for example, in electrical engineering is, is it's the peak of the vector. It's the peak of this, if X is a signal, that's the peak of the signal. The maximum absolute value, that's a norm. And there's also the one norm, which is the sum of the absolute values. Now, this one, this one, here, this one here tells you how, essentially how big a thruster you actually need to apply the forces. This norm actually is a, a very good uh, first order approximation. Uh, for example, if you really were using thrusters to position this mass, this would be something related to fuel use because that's generally how it works. Fuel use is generally proportional to the force that you apply. Okay? You can have more complicated things, but for a thruster, that's a pretty good approximation. Okay, now these are both norms uh, like, by the way, our good old friend, the Euclidean norm in this context inherits a two at the bottom um, so that you can distinguish it. These are norms. These are all three norms. They all three measure how big a force program is. This one measures it by the peak. This measures it by the, essentially the sum of the absolute values, which you can think of as fuel usage. This measures it by the sum of the squares, which we often say is energy. And that's mostly to hide the fact that in fact, we don't really care about this. It's just, this is what, this is what's easy to do mathematically, okay? That's the real reason. Now I have a question for you. I would like to know the following. What do you think, suppose I asked, instead of minimizing this over moving a mass one meter, I'd like to know what happens if you minimize the maximum? And I want you just to guess. What do you think is the optimal thing to do? What's the minimum? So you can, we can call this the gentlest transfer because I'm applying the smallest maximum force to the mass. So this you could call the minimum energy transfer. That's what we just worked out here. And I want to know what's the gentlest transfer. What's your? Exactly. So the, the minimum, I, I don't know the level, but it's whatever it has to be. It's going to be this. You're going to apply a force, a constant force up to five. You're going to constantly accelerate until five seconds, at which point you will decelerate like that with the exact, with the same force. Okay, oh, but there's a name for this. This is very famous. It's called bang, bang control for obvious reasons. It's always up at the limit uh, each time. Um, and let me ask you uh, this. You all use disk drives constantly. And those are, the, in, in a disk drive, what happens is the little, little thing is sitting there at track 23 and a signal, a command comes in to seek track uh, 125, and you have to move it there. Okay, Th I got news for you, that's this problem. Okay, and you have to do it, by the way, in, in a handful of milliseconds. Once you get there, you have to get rid of all the shaking and stuff like that. You have to be tracking something within microns or less. Okay? This, is, this is serious stuff. Okay? Um, what do you think the current signal in a disk head drive positioning system looks like? Does it look like this? Or does it look more like that? 
I'm just just guess. What's that? Yeah, the answer is it looks much more like this. Actually, it's not sharp like that. It's actually got a little bit of a rounded thing there because it's a little bit more complicated. It's taking into account all sorts of other vibration modes and stuff like that. But basically, it looks like that. Why? Because the amplifier will, soar, will source or sink a maximum amount of current. And the goal is to seek as fast as possible. And so you don't, you know, you're not, your goal is not to minimize the sum of the squares of the currents in your, in your thing. Uh, by the way, if you're worried about power, the power is closer to this in a disk drive. So, okay. Um, now let me ask you this. How about this one? What if I ask you, so we've worked out what the gentlest, well, I don't know if you'd call that gentle, uh, but um, the gentlest, in terms of the maximum force you ever apply on the mass, uh, transfers this. What about the most fuel efficient? Again, just go ahead and take a guess. People in Aeroastro could probably guess this. If you've studied satellite if you've actually sta studied how satellites are, for example, moved back on orbit, then you, you, you might know. Any other? Any guesses? You have a guess. What's your guess? What's that? You got it. So the, the optimal here is a giant force there. And oh, that's not right. There. OK, so the optimal, uh, the, the, the x that minimizes the sum, which, which would be something like the fuel use, is going to be this. It's an, it's an impulse. Well, I mean, this is silly. It's not an impulse. It lasts for a second. You do a, you do a fuel burn at the beginning. And then what that does is it just accelerates the mass. And then this is actually called the ballistic phase in the middle. Ballistic means it's just moving with no forces on it other than gravity or what. In this case, there is no gravity. So it's just floating along. And then right in the last second, you apply a, a counteracting braking force. And this minimizes the fuel. Okay? And by the way, you'll see this if you actually look at a satellite or something like that positioning itself. You'll see little puffs come out. Um, you'll see like a little puff, puff, puff come out one side, then a little bit on the other side and stuff like that. That's exactly this. I can tell you I have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. But that's fine. OK. So all of this was an aside just to say, um, oh, if you want to learn about these things, that you'd learn about this stuff in 364, which is probably not exactly the top thing on your mind at this moment. But uh, that's where it is. It, so it turns out that you can actually solve these things, uh, not with analytical formulas, but it's totally straightforward to, to actually work out these things. OK. Any, any more questions about this? OK. So the next thing I want to do is connect, is make some connections between uh, regularized least squares, actually connect least squares and least norm solutions. And the way they connect is this. Suppose we have a, a fat full rank matrix. Let's imagine now a, a two objective problem. And it looks like this. J1 is AX minus Y, norm squared, and J2 is norm, is norm X squared. Well, the, the least norm solution basically requires that you be a solution. So it requires AX equals Y. So it says, please, it says minimize J, J1 absolutely to the limit, and you get, and it minimizes J2. So in a trade-off plot, that's one of the least norm solution is one, one, one point on the trade-off curve between these two. The other point, by the way, is X equals zero, which is not very interesting, but still, it's the other point. OK. Now let's imagine doing this. Let's take a weighted sum objective, which is J1 plus mu J2 like this, and let's minimize it. That's a, this is uh, a x minus y norm squared plus mu uh, norm, norm x. And we're going to let, the, you, the solution to that is a transpose a plus mu y. Now, why, by the way, when a is fat and someone writes a transpose a, uh, you, your, uh, first of all, your height, heart rate should increase slightly. Um, you should uh, start breathing uh, sort of shallow breaths and things like that. And why is that? If you have a fat matrix and someone writes A transpose A. Your, your vocal cords should get ready to, to cry out in protest. Your autonomic response should be triggered. Uh, what, what am I talking about? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, good. OK, that's all. That's all. OK, you should, because when someone takes right, has a, a fat matrix and writes, uh, yeah, is that right? Yeah. Then this is actually, this is the product that passes the syntax scan, but is, 
you're just waiting. Especially if you see that left bracket there, that's when you should be, to you're like, you should be like, uh, uh, mm, like that. But everything is fine here because of this, okay? So that's, uh, that's, uh, all, I'm, that's all I'm saying. So this is actually cool, although it's very close to something that's not cool, and it's only cool if mu is positive. It's really not cool if mu is zero here. I mean, really not, okay? So now what happens is we're gonna let, uh, we're gonna let mu go to zero. Um, that says I care less and less about the size uh, of x. Now, when mu is zero, I actually know how to, when mu is zero, if someone just walks up to you and says, please minimize j1, um, Actually, someone can hand you back, legally, any solution of AX equals Y. So if someone hands you back two solutions of AX equals Y, and, and the, the specs actually only called for minimizing J1, that's absolutely valid. Because someone says, well, that's crazy. Someone else gave me this solution of AX equals Y where X is much smaller. And you go, sorry, I checked the specs. I didn't see any mention of the norm of X. So minimizing just J1 there are lots of solutions, and in fact, any solution of AX equals Y does the trick, big, small, or otherwise. The minute you put in mu here, for example, even if it's 10 to the minus 8, now there's a difference between the two. So if you, if you now find a solution of AX equals Y with a big, uh, with a big norm X, you're going to pay slightly more, and therefore, as long as mu is positive, it's going to show up in this composite objective. So what that tells us is that as mu goes to zero, x mu should go to x least norm. And in fact, that's exactly what happens. Now you want to be super careful here because as mu goes to zero, this matrix becomes singular. So you want, that's, you want to be very careful. That's, a, that's, a, that's essentially a denominator going to zero. That's what it is. So you're going to have to be very, very careful here. Um, and it turns out it's, it's, it's not that hard to show. Uh, it turns out that for a full rank fat uh, matrix A, it turns out that A transpose A plus mu I inverse A transpose goes to A transpose A A transpose inverse. So it actually converges to that. Um, and it, it's, it's not too hard, but it's a little bit tricky in the sense that you don't simply plug in mu equals zero. Because if you plug in mu equals zero, uh, the left-hand formula doesn't even make sense because you're inverting something which is not invertible. Okay. Nevertheless, it's, it, it, this is the case. So, okay. So that's a connection between, be, between those two. That explains one of the points on those trade-off curves. And now we're going to go to the parent of both least squares and least norm, because it's not bad to know it. So here is the common parent. The common parent is minimize norm AX minus B subject to CX equals B. So minimize a normal, a, a, a general norm of an affine function subject to a linear equality constraint. So that, that's the parent of both of them. And let's see. So in this problem, how would I reconstruct, for example, well, well, least squares is just you forget the objectives. You just, uh, sorry, you forget the constraint. How do I make, how do I make this into least norm? What would I choose to make this the least norm problem? This thing. I take A equals I and B equals zero. If I take A equals I and B equals zero, that's a, that's a general least norm problem because I'm minimizing then just norm X subject to some linear e equations. Okay, so how do we solve this? Well, uh, as, as usual, we square, the, we square the norm because minimizing the norm is the same as minimizing the square. And when you minimize the square, it's nice because we have a nice formula for the square in terms of inner products. Um, then the one half goes in front, <coughs> why? because it makes all the formulas prettier, because we're going to differentiate basically a square, and we didn't want the two uh, polluting all our formulas. So this is what we do. You form a Lagrangian now. That's the objective plus lambda transpose times CX minus D. That's this, this Lagrangian. And then we rewrite, we expand everything out, and it looks like that. So this term is from that, that first term there. That cross term is from here. Uh, this term is the third term from here, and then these are the two, two terms there. Now. One of these, that's the gradient with respect to lambda being zero, just recovers our equality constraints, not interesting. The other one says that the gradient with respect to x of, of, uh, of the Lagrangian, that's a transpose a x minus a transpose a plus c transpose a is zero. That's actually a real equation right there. 
Now, you can actually solve all these equations. I'm going to do it on the next page, but it's not pretty. And it turns out there's a, there's a better way to do this, is to write it as an equa a joint equation in both x and lambda. So we're going to do that. This top equation is AA transpose times x plus C transpose times lambda. That's this term and this term equals, and then this goes over to the right-hand side, and you get A transpose B. This equation, CX minus D equals zero, well, that's really just the constraint. I write that down here as this way, as C times X plus zero times lambda equals D. So you get this equation here. That's a square matrix, but it's a very famous matrix that comes up in lots and lots of contexts um, all over the place. It comes up in, like, economics and oh, tons of areas. It, I mean, this form of matrix. Now, if this matrix is invertible, uh, we get the solution immediately, and that's this. It's x and lambda. So both the optimal x and the optimal lambda, are, are you get them at simultaneously, and it's given by simply, well, obviously, it's the inverse of this matrix times that. Okay? Now, I actually strongly recommend uh, this is, that this is the one you should, you should, uh, you should keep in mind. Um, it's the right one. By the way, some people call this a primal dual formulation, and I can say why. Um, X is thought of as a primal variable here, and this Lagrange multiplier is a dual variable. And so in this formulation, you're really jointly finding both the primal and the dual variables. I mean, that doesn't matter, but I'm just saying that's what, that, that's what this is. Now, this will recover um, all of our formulas. So this is the common parent of both least squares and least norm, and you can recover all of our formulas. So for example, if A transpose A is invertible, that means, of course, that A has to be skinny uh, and full rank. Then you can get a, you can, you can actually block solve these equations here. Or you could just block solve these equations. So what you do is if AA transpose is invertible, I multiply this equation by AA transpose and I get X equals, you know, AA transpose inverse A transpose B and so on. That's here. You get this formula for X in terms of lambda. Now, this form, now you take this X and you plug it back into CX equals D and you get this equation. And now you can get lambda. Lambda is this. It's C, A transpose A inverse, C transpose inverse times this thing. And now, finally, you go back to this formula that gives you X in terms of lambda, and you get that. So actually, really, it's your choice. You can remember this one here or that. Uh, so it's really your choice. Um, I mean, of course, they're the same thing. This is just working out in detail what solving a block 2 by 2 system gives you. Okay. So this is the picture. Uh, you can check, by the way, if you go back to the original, uh, to the original parent problem here. Uh, you, you can check it recovers everything, absolutely everything. So for example, if A is I and B is 0, you can go down here and plug this into the horrible formulas here, uh, down here. If you have B is 0, a lot of things simplified, right? That goes away, that goes away. If A is I, all these things, say they, they all go away. And I think, yeah, sure. It looks like, except I'm seeing a, no, no, I'm not seeing a minus sign. There's a minus here and a minus there that, that cancel each other, and you're, you're recovering it. So it does kind of recover all the equations. This is useful. I think, I think we made a terrible mistake and didn't assign any homework problems that required this. Is that true? I think it's true that we, we failed to assign any homework problems that, that use this. Uh, but we just kept, kept, kept to least norm and, and uh, least squares type things. But you should know this. OK. So that finishes up all the material that will be on the midterm. And it finishes up, in fact, the first, I don't know, 40% of the course or something like that. So um, that finishes up a whole block. Um, I'm going to start the next material because we're actually in a very good position. Sometimes we don't finish the material until like Thursday. Um, oh, how do you recover the least squares problem? Well, there's actually a couple of ways to do it. Um, so uh, the simplest way is to, is to just not have C there. Um, and I believe this will actually, it'll actually work in that case. So you make C an empty matrix, whatever that is. So yeah, it works. Look, um, if, I, if I just pretend C is, I actually can't pretend C is 0. That actually won't work because this matrix won't be invertible because it'll have rows down here that are all 0. So what we have to do is, is C is null. So it, it's not even there. If C is not here, you do get this, right? You get this thing, inverse, times A transpose B. And it looks good to me. 
I mean, it's not totally straightforward, but it, that's, that's the right thing to do when C is null as opposed to being zero. Are, are, are you buying that? No, you're not. What part of it are you not buying? Uh, sorry, how, how does what? Oh, you mean up above? Oh, yeah, that's easy. Let's go back to, to that. Oh, how did... I've lost it. There it is. Okay. So here, if you want to make this least, uh, the least squares problem, all we do is we eliminate that. That's least squares. Okay. Now are you buying my other one? Okay, good. Great. Okay. Any, any other questions about, about this material? Yeah. That's um, back there somewhere. I'll find it. I've lost it. Here it is. There you go. There was one? Oh, sorry. Did you mean this for the mass? No? Oh, uh, you mean a geometric picture. Ah, OK. I'll draw it again, because it's going to be faster than my finding it. OK? So here, it, you know. The pictures are somewhat unexciting, right? Because they're generally in R two. So here's here's a set of here's a set of x such that a x equals b y. I guess we use here like that. Okay. That's that's all these points satisfy a x equals y. I mean this is silly because a is actually a a is a transpose and there's a. Okay. So that's what it looks like. Um, the least norm solution is the is so any point on here satisfies a x equals y. This point right here is the point of closest approach to the origin. That point actually has least norm. And that would be, this point would be x least norm for this problem. Oh, and how did I get the null space of A? Well, um, the null space of A in this case is, is this. And I can do that several ways. A is A transpose. A is a row vector here. Um, and A is, an, is the normal of, of this uh, hyperplane. Um, so all the if you look at all the points that are orthogonal to A, it's this line right here. Okay. Now, there's another way to see it. This, in, this, is the, this is the solution set of AX equals Y. And the point there is that the difference of any, if you ask, if someone comes up with one person has an X and another person has an X, and they both satisfy AX equals Y, the one thing you can be absolutely sure of is that the difference is in the null space. And in fact, that's if and only if. Now, so in other words, if if one person has a solution and there's an element in all space, you add it, you get a new solution. So what that said, that, that sort of makes sense here because it says that when you're moving in this direction, you're really moving in the null space. And so that's another way to understand why, this, why, why the null space would be the same thing but translated to the origin. <coughs> OK. So my claim is you know quite a lot now. Um, I mean, it's not that much math in it, but it's not trivial. You know a fair amount. and. Um, these, these methods, maybe you're convinced, maybe not. Um, uh, these, you, you can already do serious things. Um, you, you, can, you can do all sorts of stuff that you could not do by some heuristic or hacking uh, method. Um, just with least norm, least squares, throw in a little regularization, a little multi-objective, throw in a smoothing parameter, you'd be surprised uh, what you could do. Um, that, that's you, of course, and uh, computers and high quality open source software, I might add. Because uh, you can't do a whole lot. People did least squares <coughs> before they had computers. It was not pretty. Okay. It was basically you would do these things with a, with, a cal with a calculator. I mean with a mechanical calculator. And that's if you're really lucky if you had the mechanical calculator. So it was done. It's a lot easier now. You should be glad you weren't born 80 years ago. Something like that. Longer, 100. OK, if there's no more uh, questions about that, uh, we'll move on and actually cover just kind of some of the boring, stupid stuff uh, for, the, for the next topic, uh, which is autonomous linear dynamical systems. So if you can go, which is, I guess, what the class is nominally about. So we, we got to it, finally. Um, OK, so what we'll do is I'll just, I'll just go over some of the nomenclature. Um, I'll talk about some of, the, some of the basic ideas and get that over with. Um, so autonomous means that it goes by itself, and that means, in fact, that there's no, there's no input here. So what we're missing from the general formulation is this. That's just gone for a while. So we'll first understand just what happens if you have x dot equals ax. Um, 
It looks very simple. It's a first order vector differential equation. And we should probably, just as a warm up, answer the following question. If A is 1 by 1, which is to say if x is scalar, let's get this out right now. What's the solution of x dot equals ax in that case? Well, it's an exponential, right? It's something like this. It's x of t equals e to the t a uh, x of 0, something like that. Uh, no, no, it's not something like It is that, OK? That's the solution when a is uh, lowercase, which is to say it's a number, OK? So you can expect something like this to come up. By the way, uh, the qualitative behaviors of the scalar differential equation are kind of boring. Let's talk about them now. If a is 0, x dot is, it, x is a constant. It just says x dot is 0, so x is a constant. If a is positive, this, this you, get, you get a growing exponential. And if it's negative, you get a shrinking exponential. OK? So that's it. That's my discussion of x dot equals ax, where, a, where x is scalar. Okay? There's basically three qualitative types of behavior. They're all kind of boring. You can't really have anything that interesting. Okay? So just file that away. Because what we're going to do now is you'd think, if you overload this idea to vectors, how much more interesting can it be? And you'll find out very soon. Actually, it's pretty much as interesting as any dynamical system can get, almost. There's another level, but we'll, we'll get to that later. OK, now here x of t is called the state. Um, n is the state dimension, or in, informally it's the number of states. So um, it is slang to refer to xi as the, as the ith state. However, it's widely used slang. Basically, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't say that, I think. Uh, you wouldn't write that, um, but, you, but you would say it. Um, now, of course, in a lot of applications, like in uh, dynamics of structures or aircraft or something like that, the x's actually have names, like you know, x1, or they have meanings, in which case you would actually talk about that. You know, one is the yaw, and one is the yaw rate. One is your angle of attack, and all this kind of stuff, your altitude. So in that case, of course, you would, it, it's okay, well, it's still slang, but you would talk about that, those as individual states. Okay. So n is the state dimension of the number of states. A is called the dynamics matrix. Um, by the way, in lots of different fields, it's got a different name. Um, let's see, I was just talking about, uh, Aeronautics. So, what is A called in aeron? There's somebody. There's a bunch of people here in Aeroastro. What is A called uh, when this is a, a perturba perturbational model of of, uh, of, a f of a flight, some steady state flight? You know, I mean, the entries of A have A has a name, and the entries have names. Is it? That's it. So, um, in that case, the entries of A. In that case, A is called the matrix of stability derivatives. I'm not sure where that came from. Um, except that, indeed, it will de it will depend that the entries in that matrix will determine whether the the flight is uh, that flight mode is stable or not. So they're called the st stability derivatives, and I guess it's a, it's obtained from linearization of a nonlinear system. So that would explain the derivatives. So, okay, and uh, other fields have other names for it. In in circuit design, it's called the small signal dynamics matrix, or I, who knows? But anyway, lots of fields have different na they have different names for it. Okay. Um, so here's a picture. It's, uh, it's very stupid and extremely useful. It's this. So here's your state at x of t. And it's very useful to do the following. Um, of course, a x of t is just a linear. It basically, a maps x, x where, basically where you are into where you're going. Because x is where, essentially where you are in state space. x dot is where you're going. So a maps x into x dot. Oh, by the way, what are the physical units of a? Assuming, let's say all the x's are in you know, some common units. Let's just leave it that way. So all the x's have some units which are irrelevant. What are the units of a? It's inverse seconds, exactly. It's a frequency. It's a rate. That's what it is. But I mean. This is kind of obvious, but that, that, so that's what, so A is a rate. A is an inverse seconds. I mean, depends on the, the, the units in X, but generally it's an inverse seconds. By the way, that means that big A in this is a fast system, and small A is, is a slow system. I guess this is kind of obvious, so I'm going to move on. Um, let's go back over here. So X dot, which is AX, is where you're going, and it's extremely useful to take that vector and to glue its base to X. And so you have a picture like that. So if you're over here, uh, AX might point in that direction, OK? And if you're over here, AX might point in that direction, OK? And what it says 
It does not mean, of course, that x is going to be travel along this line. What it means is that along the solution of x, at this point, whatever that curve is, it's tangent to this line. And the length of that line gives you the, the actual speed at that point. OK? This is kind of obvious. All right. Now, if you draw a picture of x dot for a whole bunch of points x in a plane, you get a picture uh, called this, a lot of, it, oh, this. So there's a name for this. Um, actually, it's, it, it's a vector field. OK, so that's both, by the way, a mathematical description. That describes something which on, on some set at each point gives you a, deri a, 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 mo a derivative on the set. That's formally a vector field. So in fact, x dot equals a, a x, you would actually call in mathematics a vector field. Okay? But it's also used informally to mean something like this, where you have a, a field of, of points. And, it, and sort of at each point conceptually, of course, you don't draw it at each point. Um, you draw a little arrow that gives you a rough idea of where you're going and how fast. Okay? So this is the example for x dot equals minus 1, 0, 2, 1, x. You, we can check things. But the cool thing about this is when you see this vector field, you can actually start visualizing the trajectories. That's actually very important to understand really what's going on. So let's see what it says. It says if you're here, you're moving up and to the left, and you're moving at a pretty good clip, at least compared to over here. So although you're not going to end up here, you know, you don't know where you're going to end up, but it might be like here. And, and you can see now that you'll actually keep moving up. You might even, it looks to me like it's even accelerating. So you can imagine a point starting here as actually kind of moving up like that. Okay? On the other hand, if you're sort of over here, if you start here, you can sort of imagine now uh, various things. Um, you know, you, you might slow down. You're not going to actually hit zero. You'd slow down a lot, and then it looks like you might actually start accelerating as you go along there. Okay? So these are just the kinds of things you would get. It's, uh, by the way, if you ever have a system and you want to quickly figure out what it does, you need to look at pictures like this. Okay? Only works in two dimensions. Actually, it depends on your visualization skills. You could probably do this in three. Um, but it'd be tricky, I guess. OK. Um, here's another example. Another little baby two by two matrix. And in this case, it's this. You, you will later come to understand that you'll look at that matrix. Uh, so the same way that so far, you look at just a matrix, and you know what it means in terms of its input-output entries, right? If I write a matrix down, there's zeros, you know what it means. If there's large entries, you know what it means. If there's negative numbers, you know what it means in terms of just how the input affects the output. So that much you have, that should be wired into you by now. You will actually develop something like that for dynamics matrices. So certainly for 2 by 2s and 3 by 3s you'll start getting a very good idea. You'll look at that and, and get a rough idea. Um, there's going to have to be some computation to really know what happens, but that's the idea. So here's the vector field here, and you can kind of get a pretty good idea for it. Um, here, it looks like the trajectories are kind of elliptical. Now, I'll tell you what you can't tell by your eyeball here is, unless you were super duper careful, you can't tell if the trajectories are actually, are they winding in or are they winding out? You'd have to really kind of trace this very carefully and figure out if when you kind of come around one cycle, you're bigger or smaller than you were before. Okay, so that's, I think, not obvious from here. It will be very obvious to you in a week as to how to do that. But that's the, that's the idea. Okay. Now, another very useful thing is a block diagram. Um, so you can write x dot equals ax this way. Uh, by the way, it's done not with differentiators, but with integrators. So that's, uh, and there's historical reasons for it. Um, well, I'll tell you what the historical reason. Actually, does anyone know the historical reasons for it? It's entirely likely that you're all too young to have any. Uh, this is in the deep. This is we're talking slide. We're talking before slide rules here. Anyone here ever use a slide rule? Cool. Zero. You did. That is so cool. Did you do it as a joke or no? You really did. You really used it. Well, it was my dad's. It was your dad's. Huh? There you go. So, all right. So, this still that's cool though. Do you actually know how to use it? Uh, one, but... Cool. That's, that's about the right. That, that's about how it should stay. OK. So, um, so I can tell you, the, I'll tell you the historical reason for this. So first, let me just say what this is. Um, this is a vector. These are vector signals. And it's sometimes common, I guess this is from digital circuit design, to, to take in a, in a signal flow graph to put a little note with a line through it. I don't know why 
this tradition came up. And this tells you the dimensions. So that's, that's a vector signal with n components, x of t. It goes into a. So, so what comes out here is ax. And that goes into uh, 1 over s is actually, you really should write that as i over s. Uh, because this is, so you would interpret this because it's a vector in, signal in, vector signal out as a, you would actually, the slang for this on the street should be a bank of integrators. That would be the slang for this. Because if I exploded this out and showed the individual components, it would really look like this. It would look like that. Let's say if it's two by two. So that's if I clicked on that box and, and asked for the detail, I would get this. Okay? So it looks like that. Uh, so it would be a bank of, of integrators. These are now scalar integrators. Here. Okay. And now let me get to why integrators. So um, nowadays, you will, you, you will soon see how to actually solve the equation x dot equals a of x. Um, it won't be surprising to you that you can, uh, you can work out the whole trajectory for x, 1,000, uh, 2,000. I mean, these are just enormous systems just immediately on a laptop. I mean, 2,000 is not immediately, all right? But 1,000, even 500 is extraordinary. Okay? So a 500 state model will model a lot of things. I mean, that's actually a fairly detailed structural model of a lot of things. You can actually just solve x dot equals ax. It's nothing. It's going to be two lines of code, something like that. If that, it'll run on a laptop, not yet a phone, but that's coming. It'll, it'll and, and just get it. So it's like, it's sort of like least squares. For you, it's nothing. It's backslash, right? For your parents, it was much more complicated. It was a half day of coding Fortran. Don't even ask what your grandparents had to do to do least squares. They, maybe not your exact grandparents, but somebody's grandparents did it, and it wasn't that cool. Um, it was mechanical calculators or sheets or slide rules, lots of people in rooms. So it was done. So um, all right, back to this. In the, I don't know, in the 20s, 30s, actually even earlier than that, I think this, anyone know? You want to do a Wikipedia on differential engine, Vannevar Bush, differential engine, differential analyzer. There you go. Um, so that actually, I believe, might even be late 19th century. Um, so in the late 19th century, it, it was already recognized that x dot equals ax was, an, was that if you understood what the solutions of that did, you could actually say a lot about how a machine or something like that was going to work. That was all, or how, 19 what? Well, I was off as usual. It's good. good thing I'm not in the history department, but I'm allowed to. I got it vaguely right. It was a, a long time ago. So 1927. So in 1927, oh, but maybe that's the, is that the mechanical one? OK. So this guy built a mechanical system that will actually, that will actually give you the approximate solution of x dot equals ax. Okay. Not long after that, people built vacuum tube computers, like an analog computers. This, this means nothing. Thank God, actually. To anyone, no, nothing. No one's even heard of this. That is so good. Usually, you've heard of it? That's so good. Did you actually see one? No. Okay. That's too bad. I should bring in some pictures um, just so you know how lucky you are now. Um, yeah, what's that? Yeah, they're typically in basements now or storage closets. Yes, that's right. Did you saw. You, Yeah, sure. They really used them. Okay, so what it was was this. It was an elect. You had a big patch panel, and you had electronic integrators. I guess anyone here in electrical engineering knows how to do that with an op amp and a capacitor and in, in, in the feedback loop. So you get an integrator, and you had a big. You had a whole bunch of integrators, and then you had uh, little uh, like uh, banana plug things, and you could plug you could plug these up, and you could wire them up. They had little gain units that you would dial in. They're really quite beautiful. I actually I never touched one, so to see you know. Just to see, you know. Uh, um, so, and you dial in little gains and things like that. And you'd, and you'd have a whole pan. So how would you actually program this analog computer? You'd do it by actually physically hooking wires up between these things. Okay? And then there'd be a big, button you, a big button and you'd press start. And all sorts of red lights would come on, meaning that things just overflowed their, their ranges. Right? And that either means you messed up the programming, which in this case literally means plugging wires in, um, or it means you sh probably shouldn't build that aircraft. Uh, it uh, means one or the other, and you'd have to figure out which it was. Oh, and the way you would, uh, the way if you had like a class, pro a, cl a class like a homework exercise on the analog computer, the way it would work was actually kind of cool. Um, you'd have gra your program would be this big thing like this with all your wires on it, and you would detach the whole thing, and then walk around with it, and then the other another student would come in and plug theirs into the analog computer. 
Oh, I mean, are, are you at least a little bit grateful now about when you were born and stuff? I mean, I hope so. Yeah. I'll, I'll take that as a, 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 a small sign of gratitude. Watch out, because provoke me and homework eight, analog computer. And if you don't think I can find one on eBay, you are wrong. OK, so all right. What's that? Oh. <laughs> Jacob, I, I'm going to take that as an open challenge. Can you? OK, cool. No, you know what we'll do? What's that? Oh, OK. Yeah, actually, the TAs have to take this, this uh, course on you know ethical actions and this so Jacob is exercising his right to not to not be involved in such an escapade but that would be great no maybe we'll do it with like white proto boards and op amps and capacitors that would be that would be great okay all right but it's noted that there's been a challenge okay. all right all right back back to this so so there the, the reason was that that you find integrators here is, is because of this. Oh, and by the way, I guess you, you mentioned, someone, you, you knew what the story was. Um, so this was used in 1939 through 1945 um, at MIT. They put these things together. Uh, they weren't quite linear. Uh, they actually had other terms. In fact, it was just basically uh, you'd fire a shell and wanted to work out firing tables. And a firing table was for a certain shell, if you fired at this angle and there's a wind in a certain direction, the question is, where does it land? And you would solve a, a differential equation like this. It wasn't quite linear. It had one nonlinear term in it. And this was done, in fact, in secret in a basement in MIT uh, with analog computers. And then the, the results, you just tabulate, just ran all the time. And they'd work out the things. And then when you wanted to use it, you'd check the wind, uh, figure out, you know, go on the table, find the range, and find out you should elevate it uh, 22.63 degrees. Okay, so that's that that that's what this was. Okay. All right. Um, so that's a, just a historical comment ab ab about why you see integrators and why this block diagram uh, would strike fear into the hearts of your parents and grandparents if they did this kind of thing, but not you. So, and what, that's why you should be grateful. <clears throat> uh, okay. All right. Okay, so if you, if you draw a block diagram out, if you explode the block diagram of A, you can actually get interesting information. Um, here's an example. Suppose you have x dot is AX, where A is block upper triangular. Well, by now, if you just see this, if you see Y equals AX and A looks like that, you know exactly what it means. Without even thinking, you would say, hey, how, how interesting. The bottom half of, let's suppose that's Y, you'd say that the bottom half of Y doesn't depend on the first half it doesn't have to be half, of course, but the first part of x, that's what you'd say when you see that. But now that's the derivative, which is actually more interesting. So you read this equation this way. You'd say something like, where the bottom half of x is going, that's English for x2 dot, doesn't depend on x1. That's the 0. Okay. And when you draw the block diagram, it's, super ob it's it totally obvious, because you draw it this way. Here's x1 x1 dot is a11 x1 plus a12 x. Oh, I, I didn't say something here. Um, the rule here is this. If you want to know how do you get x1 dot if, on, if all you have are integrators, um, you look at the output of an integrator and you ask, well, what went, if that's an integrator and what came out is x, what had to go in was x dot. So that's how you do. So you simply, you go backwards through the integrator if you want to get x dot. So the inputs to integrators are derivatives. So this is x1 dot and this is x2 dot and this says x1 dot is a it's a sum of two things that's what the summing junction does it's a11 x1 plus a12 x2 now when you stare through this block diagram something exceedingly obvious comes up and that's this if I draw a dashed line like that you see something really interesting and that is that information flows from the bottom to the top but not vice versa. So nothing that happens up top ever has an effect on what goes on down here. Okay, And basically it says x2 affects x1, but x1 has no effect whatsoever on x2. That means all sorts of interesting things. We've concluded things like this. 
it says that x2, you can actually calculate the solution of x2 separately because it has no, it is in no way affected by x1. That, that's what this says. And that's what you get out of looking at that equation. I mean, it's kind of, well, we'll see lots of other ways to do it, but this is, this is kind of the, idea, the way to get the, uh, the, the, um, the intuition for how this works. Everybody see this? So that's the, that's the picture here. So let's see, let's look at a couple of examples. I think I'll look at uh, just one, which is a, a linear circuit. So here I have a, a, cir a linear static circuit. Now that means it's a circuit that can contain things like resistors, uh, transformers. It can have, oh, let's see. Well, it depends on your model of a transformer. Um, if it's an inductive model, you have to put it out here. Um, so we'll skip transformers. But it can have things like uh, uh, dependent sources and things like that. So, so that, that's what's in here. And I pull the capacitors out to the left and the inductors off to the right. And the equations here are very simple. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're not in EE and don't know these equations, so that, that doesn't really matter. It's just an example. So here, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, the, the equations here for each capacitor are this. It's C dV dt is the charging current. And I've, I've drawn the charging current um, to go into the capacitors like that. For the inductors, it's the same thing. It's, it's L di dt is the charging voltage. So for an inductor, again, I'm ad addressing people who do EE, right? Um, for an inductor, you think of a voltage as charging it. When you apply voltage to an inductor, it, it ramps up the current. When you apply a current to a capacitor, it ramps up its voltage. Okay, so you get these equations. And then this thing is some horrible complicated thing, but the point is it's linear. So it's a set of linear equations that relate these, these are the port variables, the voltage and the current, and the voltage and the current at these ports. That's called a port when you, when you hang two wires out of a circuit, it's a port, okay? And it's a linear relation that, that covers these, uh, these the, the voltages and currents at the port, the port variables. And we're gonna write that in this way. We're gonna say that the inductor, sorry, the capacitor current and the inductor voltage, actually these are the charging, these are basically the charging variables is some matrix times uh, VC and IL. So we're going to write it that way. All right. And we'll let C be a diagonal matrix with these capacitors and L this thing so that I can write these out as matrix equations. And if you have state VC and IL, so the state is the voltage on the capacitor and the inductor current, then you can write out everything here as, it's very simple, it's, this is C V dot, here is IC, and this is L I dot, uh oh, that's hard to make a dot and make it clear, um, equals VL. And you simply put those equations into here, uh, take C inverse on the left hand side, and you get a set of equations like this. Okay? So this tells you that you can write out. And this is, of course, an autonomous linear system. That's AX. A is this matrix here. OK? So uh, by the way, this is already of huge interest. Um, it says that, for example, again, this is addressed to people in EE. It says, for example, if you have an interconnect circuit in some leading edge, you know, 45 nanometer design, it says that if you want to analyze the interconnect in some digital circuit, some high performance circuit, which you can model as uh, certainly with some nowadays with some inductance, capacitance, and resistance. It says you can write that as x dot equals ax, period. That's what it does. So that, that means it's already of extreme interest uh, in practice to know what the solutions of this do. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll quit here. <laughs>